Welcome to the Transportation Committee. This uh, meeting is called to order for January 19th, 2022. Boy, it doesn't seem possible, does it? Welcome back. Uh, we have a, a few uh, items to take care of before we have a presentation today, but I want to uh, uh, introduce, we have new staff as well. I want to introduce the staff. Uh, my new assistant is Sarah Hutton. Where is Miss Sarah? Stand up so they can see you, Sarah. This is Sarah. We're thrilled to have Sarah. Her predecessor got promoted to the budget department, and uh, so Sarah is the new staff person, and she is doing an excellent job, by the way. And uh, our committee intern is Isabel Page. Isabel, if you'd stand up. Glad to have you. Isabel is a st uh, student at Austin P University and uh, comes to us from Clarksville, doing a good job. Uh, committee attorneys to my left is Joel Hayes. You're, he's no uh, stranger to you. And uh, our committee research analyst, Jeremy Maxwell, to my right, doing a good job as always. Our clerk is uh, Catherine Latham. Did I pronounce that right? Catlin? It's Catherine, sir. Okay, thank you. And uh, Jordan Nickel to her right, and uh, they are doing a good job for us. Sergeant at Arms is Reuben Sanders, and it's good to see Reuben again. And let's see, we have one new member on this committee, and we'll get to the, uh, uh, give him a hard time later, but today I will just tell the committee that this is, this is his first committee, not just House committee, but this is his first committee meeting. So, you know, do with that information whatever you want to do. I don't know. <laughs> but we're glad to have, we're, we're really, really glad to have my friend. I, I knew Greg long before he was elected, and he's a fine gentleman, and we're glad to have him as a wonderful addition to the House Transportation Committee and look forward to working with him. Uh, and I did call your name, so uh, Representative <laughs> Vital, if you want to respond, you're welcome to do so. <laughs> <laughs> They've muted me already. <laughs> well, I'm honored to be here, and uh, I look forward to serving this committee. Transportation is important to me. It's exciting because uh, two weeks after I got elected, uh, a major highway project started right near my house in adjacent district in Mr. And he's taking full credit and, for and, it. And they said, man, you're making <laughs> things happen. So it's, I'm great. it's glad to be here. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to work well together, as you can see. Uh, I see some of our department liaisons in the audience, and I, I probably will miss several, and I'm sorry, but I do see um, uh, TDOT uh, uh, Attorney Brian Carroll. Brian's in the back, raises his hand. Uh, John Waddell. Is John here? I haven't seen John. Uh, these two guys will be around anytime we have a committee meeting. Good resource if you need some information, reach out to uh, Brian or John. Also, uh, the liaison attorney, Elizabeth uh, Stroker, Elizabeth's in the back. She kind of lives in our committee. And uh, if you need any information from her concerning uh, safety, uh, she's a great resource and has good insight. We've had several conversations already th this session. And uh, James, oh, I'm sorry, James. James Hell, yes, I'm so sorry. I saw you earlier and I did fail to write your name down. And who else did I miss? Apparently none. Okay, good for me. Um, now for the good news. Transportation Committee, we will be meeting at 8 a.m. on Tuesdays in House Hearing Room 1, right here. Uh, this was unavoidable. Uh, the numbers just didn't work otherwise. And uh, we're working on trying to find a way to adjust that time because I know it's awfully hard for 11 people to get up that early in the morning and make a quorum. And uh, I, have, I have made the clerk's office aware of that, that we have some people that can't get out of bed. But uh, until further notice, we will be meeting at 8 a.m. on Tuesdays in this room right here. You might want to make a note also, we do have uh, omnibus bills already filed, and the omnibus bill numbers, and we'll send out an email on this, by the way. Omnibus bill numbers for highways and bridge naming is House Bill 1654, 
and the license plates, omnibus bills, special license plates is House Bill 1655. And again, I'll send, we'll, uh, Sarah will send those uh, numbers out to you later. Uh, since we're meeting at 8 a.m. on Tuesdays, that means your uh, amendment filing deadline is going to be 10 a.m. on Mondays. So keep that in mind. Mondays at 10 a.m. Uh, so it would probably be best to get it in by Friday because not a lot of people here at 10 a.m. on Mondays. Okay, any questions, comments from members? Chairman Whitson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm happy to announce that Transportation Subcommittee will meet on Tuesdays, but at 1.30 p.m. Oh. <laughs> Seemed like we got it backward, didn't it, Sam? That's <laughs> something, yeah, yeah, never mind. Okay, well, we'll, thank you, Mr. we'll be a week behind. Anyone else? Questions or comments for what I said? I guess not. We're glad to have uh, a presentation today, and I want to thank Megan Frazier for helping us with this. Um, she kind of lives in this committee, too, occasionally. <laughs> but uh, we have a, a good presentation today, and I asked them to come because we had this presentation about four years ago. I forget when it was. Oh, we got to take that. Okay. Uh, while our guest is coming, I guess I better do something official and take the roll. So, Clerk, will you take the roll? <laughs> I'm out of practice. I'm sorry. Representatives Boyd, Campbell, Grills, Here. Halford, Hicks, Here. Hurt, Here. Keesling, Here. Marsh, Here. McKenzie, Here. Potts, Here. Powers, Here. Russell, Here. Thompson, Here. Todd, Here. Towns, Vital. Weaver, Here. Whitson, Here. Vice Chairman Hall, Here. Chairman Howell. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. All right. Uh, we have a presentation, and we had this uh, industry come once before a few years ago, but we have new members since then, and it's, I think it's always interesting. When people think of the Transportation Committee, they usually think of roads and bridges. Uh, but uh, this committee uh, deals with a lot of different issues regarding transportation. And I was uh, stunned when I first became chairman to learn that the largest uh, barge company in the United States is stationed right here, headquartered here in Nashville. And I thought, what a great opportunity we have to uh, kind of educate uh, committee members on, on what's happening in that area of transportation. So we have with us today Mr. Andrew Brown, Vice President of Ingram Barge, and we're glad to have you with us today, uh, Mr. Brown. And if you would, just um, uh, uh, begin your presentation. We might have some questions later. But, Absolutely. Uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And hopefully everyone can hear me all right. As uh, the chairman so graciously introduced me, my name is Andrew Brown. I'm the vice president of legal and claims at Ingram Barge Company here in Nashville. And I'm honored by the invitation to present to you today. The title of the presentation suggests that we've had a couple unsettled years, and I think those, the, the reasons for which are pretty obvious. I'd like to get into some of those reasons as we go. And please, if you do have questions, by all means, interrupt at any point. I'm happy to address them on, on the spot. So a brief agenda for today. I'd like to give you some background on our company. We'll talk some industry basics, and then I'd like to spend a few moments on the economic impacts of our industry here in the state of Tennessee and also nationally. We'll spend a, just, just a second on COVID, and then from there, I have two requests for consideration that I'd like to present to the committee. On the right, the picture I think probably needs no introduction. This was just one of the, the several challenges we, we faced last year in 2021. Um, the bridge over the Mississippi River connecting Memphis and Arkansas obviously had a structural defect, shut down the river for several days, Obviously, much more of an imposition to drivers, truckers, um, but you know it could have been catastrophic for our industry as well had the river remained closed. There really is no substitute for the Mississippi River. We don't have a detour, and so that, that waterway needs to stay open, if at all possible. Ingram Barge Company is a subsidiary of Ingram Industries Incorporated, which is a Tennessee company, um, multi-generational, family-owned, and operated. Currently, John and Orrin Ingram are the principals. Barge Company is a subsidiary, and um, we employ about 2,000, we call them associates, but employees, about two-thirds of which work out on the, the boats as our marine associates, and the rest are, are shorebound. 
Um, of those about 2,000 positions, 500 are Tennessee residents. Ingram Industries as a whole employs about 7,000 people internationally, and about 3,500 are Tennessee residents. As the chairman mentioned, we operate one of the largest fleets in the industry. We're the largest on the, the dry cargo barge side. Uh, we're second, I think, in boats, and, and this is a, a profile of our tow boats. Uh, they range in size from 800 horsepower on the, the small end all the way up to 10,500 horsepower on the large end, and, and those are very large pieces of equipment. About 4,000 dry cargo barges, basically big floating metal boxes, 200 feet long, 35 feet wide. And then we also have a small liquids fleet, so about 400 tank barges. Here's a nice picture showing a, uh, a tow, which is a configuration of barges with several of the tank barges in the middle, the center string, and then some covered and uncoppered, uncovered dry hopper barges flanking, flanking that center string. Ingram Barge Company has been aggressively recapitalizing its fleet since 2007, and we've built over 1,700 new barges, both dry and liquid. Many of those barges were constructed right up the road in Ashland City at Arcosa, and there's a significant economic impact there. We'll look at those numbers in a minute. We're also, for the first time in about the last 40 years, um, rebuilding or, or building some new boats down in Indiana. Is everybody hearing me all right? I feel like I'm coming in and out. My apologies. Uh, the barges are typically 30-year assets. Boats can last up to 50 years. And so you, you think about what we've been doing here to recapitalize just really speaks to the Ingram family's commitment to this business. Some terminology for you here. They're called tow boats, but they don't actually tow anything. They push the barges. When you have a flotilla of barges wired together with a boat behind it, we call that a tow. So slightly counterintuitive, I suppose. Toes can be rather large. Here in this picture, this is a lower Mississippi River tow. It's eight barges long, so 1,600 feet long, and seven barges wide, so about 250 feet wide. And there really is, uh, it's, it's pretty incomparable to stand at the head of the tow um, and, and to ride on one of these barges. That's really the best way to experience the industry, to understand the scale, the scope. And uh, as I did earlier in the, the, the Senate committee this morning, love to extend the, the invitation for any members here. If they'd like to get out and do a ride with us, we'd be happy to facilitate that. So as we said, 1,600 feet long. Here's, here's a comparison, Empire State 1250, Willis Tower 1454. We've got both of those structures beat. We're also larger than the largest aircraft carrier in the, the U.S. Navy's fleet. This is the Gerald Ford, built in 2017. It's about 1,100 feet long, so we've got them beat by 500 feet. And with apologies to any, any um, friends of the, the trucking industry here, and I'll just say this, I'll caveat, we, we understand that every mode has its own place in the transportation needs port portfolio of the United States. Um, but we do have them beat on the capacity side, 1,500 tons versus 2,200 tons, or excuse me, 22 tons in a tractor trailer. This gives you a nice comparison. Uh, we use the 15 barge tow as our metric because when you get into the locking rivers, including the, the Tennessee, the Cumberland, um, you're limited in tow size based on the size of those structures. So even at 15 barges, that is the equivalent of over 200 rail cars or over 1,050 tractor trailers. And when you're able to move at that scale, there's a fuel efficiency gain as well. And this graph here shows how far you can move one ton, so 2,000 pounds of cargo, by each of the various modes. Uh, 150 miles by truck, 478 miles by rail, and over 600 miles on the waterways. When you use less fuel, you create less, less emissions, and ever since the changeover in Washington, um, you know, our customers, many of which are internationally situated, are very focused on emissions, and so we, we are closely monitoring this, and of the three modes currently, we, we produce the, less, the least emissions when we move cargo. All right, so let's talk economic impacts. Um, this is a Price Waterhouse study and I apologize the text is small. I think you all have access to the, the, the slide deck, though. 
uh, but I'll read some of the highlights from it. 2019 study, and it shows that Tennessee is home to over 20,600 domestic maritime jobs, of which I would consider my, my job one of those 20,000. Um, that ranks us number eight in the entire country for domestic maritime jobs. The economic impact of having that many jobs here in the state is 4.9 billion in just total economic impact, and then 1.2 billion in annual worker income. On the shipyard side, the annual economic impact is over $400 million. And again, I mentioned when we're rebuilding or building new barges at Arcosa in Ashland City, I must have hit the button. Uh, that's one of several shipyards here in the state, but there's a tremendous economic benefit to having those located here within the, the Tennessee state boundaries. Nationally, the domestic maritime industry accounts for almost 650,000 jobs. Um, with almost 42 billion in annual worker income and almost 155 billion in annual economic output. So it's a major industry and, and we're fortunate to have um, this, this many jobs as part of that industri industry here in Tennessee. Here's a graph showing what, what we move on the, the waterways. Um, over half a billion tons moves annually. And just this pie chart gives you an idea of what some of those, those materials are. I would roughly categorize them as the, the feedstock or the building blocks of a lot of other, other industries. So you have petroleum products, coal, um, aggregates or building materials, a lot of agricultural materials move, chemicals, crude oil, iron and steel, and then, then a small uh, swath of other, other materials. That half a billion tons annually equates to over $134 billion in commodity value. Um, and this just gives you an idea of, of you know, where you apportion those, those values. Zooming in a bit here in the state of Tennessee, the most recent numbers that we have available are from 2018, where we moved nearly 31 million tons of freight. And this is just on the Tennessee River and on the Cumberland River. We excluded the Mississippi River since it is kind of the major thoroughfare that connects all of the various river systems. Of the, that 31 million tons of freight, um, just the top three different uh, cargo classes, so aggregates, sand, gravel, etc., about 9.4 million tons. Coal represents 6.2 million tons and petroleum products uh, about three and a half million tons. And the, the picture on the left here shows the overlay of the Tennessee and Cumberland River and then the red is the Colonial Pipeline. Interestingly enough, a lot of the fuel that gets consumed here in the Nashville or the Mid-State region comes in by river barge. We don't move it um, at, at Ingram, but several other companies do. And I know during the Colonial Pipeline shutdown, which was another, another challenge for the country last year, um, the, the, the river industry stepped up and started moving more volume via water to this market and, and several others to try and account for the pipeline being out of service. In our opinion, we are an underutilized resource. With limited investment, we could double our capacity, and that investment would, would come in the form of rebuilding lock and dam infrastructure, much of which is well beyond its original 50-year service life. Great news to report here, however. And before I get to that, I would just say, looking at the, the impact we can have and, and the amount of, of um, the, the capacity translation, we do have the ability to help relieve congestion on, on interstate roadways. This is a picture from outside the Atlanta metropolitan area, but obviously scenes like this were not uncommon pre-pandemic here in the mid-state region as well. So the infrastructure bill that passed last year included $2.5 billion for lock and dam infrastructure upgrades, which puts us in a really great position to start tackling some of our priority projects. This list here, and I, again, I apologize for the small text, but it shows our, our top priority projects and those that are highlighted are the ones that we're most focused on bringing that $2.5 billion to in the form of construction spending. We obviously have to work with the Corps of Engineers to make that happen. Great news on that front. We just found out today that our top project, which is Lock and Dam number 25, located in Missouri slash Illinois, is going to be one of the projects that gets fully funded this year. You'll note that in the, the state column here, none of these projects are directly located in Tennessee. 
but from the the industry's perspective, I'd say that's that's okay because it is a unified system. There really aren't any detours, and so if you have a lock and dam problem on one segment of the river, that directly impacts and affects the other segments. So again, approaching this in a unified fashion and focusing on our top project, our top priority projects makes sense from a, a system operator's perspective. The system itself is, is world class. We have 12,000 miles of navigable inland waterways. And you can see in this map here, all of the major metropolitan areas that the river can and does serve. Spend 60 seconds on COVID here. It's been difficult for us. Um, when you think about the way our, our boats operate, especially those larger boats that I mentioned earlier, we have crews that live in close quarters on those boats for 28 days at a time. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we weren't sure what sort of impact the, the, the coronavirus was going to have on our crews and our operations. Um, we weathered the storm fairly well, I would say. Um, our experience with confirmed cases in, in the marine population is about half of what we've seen nationally in the U.S., which is, which is good. I will say that the Omicron variant has hit us pretty hard of late, and we've had more boats impacted and tied up as we work through quarantining and, and getting people back to full health. I will also say that our experience has been that the Omicron variant is less severe. We've had a couple people go to the hospital, but for very short duration. Overall, everyone seems to be recovering well. So it is my hope, and I'm, I'm sure many on the committee share this, share this view, that this will be the last year, hopefully, that, that coronavirus has this sort of impact on industry as a whole. Brings me now to my first request for consideration, and that is state-level support of the Jones Act. What is the Jones Act? It is a law that was passed in 1920, federal law, that says, in essence, that any waterborne commerce moving between two inland points on the rivers or two coastal points on, on the coastal areas must be carried on ships that are built in the U.S., that are crewed by U.S. citizens, and that are also U.S. owned. I think the primary purpose of, of the law is um, national security minded, and that is to make sure we protect our domestic shipbuilding capabilities. If you think about places like China, that are, where they're chur churning out ships at uh, an un unprecedented rate, unprecedented rate uh, thanks to financing that's available through the, the Communist Party, their aim is pretty clear. I think they would love to see or love to become the dominant player in international ocean shipments. They would, by extension, love to be the dominant player in domestic U.S. maritime shipments, but for the Jones Act. Um, and so when we think about the over billion dollars that the Ingram family and Ingram company has invested in our fleet, we simply couldn't compete if tomorrow the Jones Act were watered down and allowed foreign-built equipment built in places like this giant state-run shipyard in China um, where you know the labor practices are, are somewhat lacking, we would say. We just couldn't compete with that, and it would instantly devalue the, the, the investment we have in our fleet. And so the ask here is quite simple, and, and we've seen um, other, other states go in this direction. When you think about the economic impact that the Jones Act has, um, talking about now the, the 20,000 plus jobs here domestically, or here in the, the state of Tennessee, almost $5 billion in annual economic impact, that is all directly attributable to the Jones Act. Without the Jones Act, that goes away. And so a state like West Virginia, which does not even rank top 10 in domestic maritime jobs, um, last year their Senate passed a resolution basically saying that they understand the importance of the Jones Act to West Virginia and the country as a whole, um, and, and they, they passed this resolution. We view the Jones Act as one of the original and most effective Made in America laws. And so if there's anyone here on this committee that would like to sponsor such a resolution, I'd be glad to connect you with, uh, with the resources to make that happen. I will say that on the Senate side this morning, there was, there was pretty good interest in doing so. So I'd love to extend that, that offer to this, this body as well. That brings me to my second request for consideration, and that is an increase in intermodal port development funding. Kind of a mouthful there. Um, what we're talking about here, so on the coastal areas, you have good intermodal ports. A lot of containers move through those facilities. Inland, we have pretty strong port infrastructure, but we do, what we do not have is the capacity or the easy means of 
handling containers and then interchanging them from rail and truck onto the waterways. By comparison, in the European Union, uh, they seem to have this figured out, and I think that's because they recognize the, the tremendous opportunities presented by the inland river systems there. This is a picture from the port of Duisburg, which is in Germany. And in this port, they have the distinction, with, it's the largest inland intermodal port anywhere in the world. And um, last year, they handled 4.2 million containers. And uh, by, by the, the port's own metrics, that, that port facility supports or generates 50,000 jobs within the, the port itself and in the immediate the, uh, surrounding communities. There's no reason um, that we could not have a, a version of, of the Duisburg port in Memphis or elsewhere in Tennessee. We sense that there's an appetite for um, container shippers to find greener ways of moving their containers inland. And you think about the fuel efficiency, the carbon efficiency that our mode presents. Um, all it would take is some additional funding to increase the port capacity. Our primary target in this space, I think, would be Memphis. And having um, some of this infrastructure in place there would allow us to chase after the targets, which are these large container vessels now moving through the, the uh, Panama Canal expansion, which opened several years ago. Those ships largely bypass the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast ports, which are river served, and head to, to the eastern seaboard, and then are either moved via truck or rail. We know, we've all heard the, the stories about the supply chain bottlenecks in the, uh, the Senate side this morning. We heard about truck driver shortages here in the state of Tennessee and nationally. If we were able to pick off some of these ships, have them stop in Gulf Coast ports, offload some of their containers, transfer those to river barges, you know, we could directly impact and, and reduce the pressure on those other modes and also bring a lot more commerce to communities that need it here within Tennessee. Similar picture, this is from the port of Basel in Switzerland. Again, pretty far inland, and, and again, I think they just understand the importance, and they've, they've gone ahead and made these sorts of investments and are now reaping the benefits of those investments. We've had some limited success with container on barge at Ingram, something that we're still actively pursuing. This is a picture of us loading out some containers into one of our dry cargo barges um, in the port of Paducah. And I'll just share this graph with you, or this slide. It just shows that several other states, area states, Illinois, Arkansas, Missouri, Kentucky, are all starting to spend um, to, to upgrade their port infrastructure. So at a time when there, there are or, or will be federal dollars fl flowing to the state from the infrastructure bill passed last year, we'd ask for your consideration and in, in, you know, spending or investing some of that money in inland port infrastructure. And with that, I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you, Mr. Brown. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm sure we have some questions and comments. Let me tell the committee, first of all, that I believe this presentation is available on your dashboard, on your iPad. So if you want to view that again, uh, maybe that you didn't get all the information. Uh, it's available to you on your dashboard. Uh, any questions or comments? Representative, you're, you're recognized. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very interesting. As a Memphian, it's it's something I've always been close to. My father worked on the river, and uh, um, something is, I've been close to all my life. Um, my understanding, I, I know you know, right now there are short labor shortages in a lot of industries, and of course we know about the uh, truck driver shortage, but um, my understanding from what, just talking to people who've worked on uh, on barges that uh, uh, it, it's been even worse in a long period of time for uh, for for finding people to uh, to work in all levels on uh, on barges and towboats. Is that true? And can you address that? I won't try to speak for the industry here, but just our own experience at Ingram has been, I think we were pretty well staffed up until the pandemic started. And, and just, you know, 2020 and beyond, we've had a lot more, it's taken a lot more effort to keep our boats operational. And I think that, you know, has to do with sort of the, the, the government funds that were available to, to keep people home in the early stages of the pandemic. And now it's just the, the you know, the all out competition for, for workers in the workforce. 
Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Any other questions from members, Representative Towns? Thank you again for your presentation. As the chairman says, very interesting. Have you been to Memphis and looked at those uh, NMO ports that we have there? I've not directly been to Memphis, but we've got some folks who are looking at and scouting out locations actually pretty actively these days. Where are you based out of? Uh, we're here in Nashville, sir. I'd love to have you come down with Dwayne and myself and take a look at them. We've got some stuff on, over on Lamar and some other places uh, in Memphis I think you'd be impressed with. However, certainly there needs to be some expansion of uh, those areas to accommodate twice as much quadruplet, whatever we can. But love for you to come down and check it out. You were talking about 200 and uh, was that was it 2.5 billion for infrastructure? Where is that money coming from? Uh, those are federal dollars, sir. Okay, those are only federal federal dollars that you were talking about. That's correct. Because yeah. that's this latest round that that the, they're talked about with infrastructure. Yes. Okay, so that would be 2.5. Billion just for Tennessee or for what? That that is allocated to lock and dam infrastructure across the country or just in across Iowa? the country. Yes, sir. And That's so we've been working very actively in Washington to try and make sure it goes to those priority projects. So the, the list of which you have in the presentation. Right, because that's not a lot of money for for the entire country. It, it's a, it's certainly an improvement. I right. think the annual spend has been something akin to four or five hundred million dollars per year. So. And there is, there is, you know, we have a tax on our diesel fuel that we consume on the boats, okay. which goes into a trust fund, and that gets matched with federal dollars. So there is a program in place where we have been able to work and chip away at the backlog of projects. Okay. The two point five billion dollars, it kind of, it's it turbocharges that Obviously process. That helps a lot. Correct. That's what you're saying. Well, uh, here, passing a resolution, how does that impact the bottom line financially? Because a resolution doesn't necessarily mean that we allocate dollars. How does that in your opinion, impact what you're doing? Sure. The, the resolution is, is, in my view, a, a separate issue. That's just to, to pledge state support for the right. Jones Act and recognize the importance of the Jones Act and, and what it means for those 20,000-plus uh, homegrown jobs here in Tennessee. But it doesn't really transfer into dollars and cents, does it? Th that's correct. Right. Okay. So the, the port, um, intermodal port, uh, upgrades, if you will, that, that's a separate issue. And right. I don't have a specific number in mind. I think it's just something that it's a worthy endeavor. It's something that should be explored. Absolutely, because uh, anything we're doing where I am at this point, and have been for some time, anything that we can do to make sure that our country is self-sufficient, not that we're trying to be isolationist or anything of that nature, but I just think it's very important and wise, especially looking at the world and China, number one, and the moves of Russia um, uh, make it and some of the other places, we need to be as, as self-sufficient as we possibly can. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and as we have done, if we can control certain industry, obviously we want to do that. It's very important that we, uh, you know, stay focused on that and get it done as quickly as we possibly can. So I'd also love to chat at some point to see what kind of revenue we really need for Tennessee to, uh, because I, we have a main artery down there, we had to collapse, the, not to collapse, but the, the problem with the bridge, and the, there were millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars that were lost during that time. Commerce, or just whomever, going across gas uh, increase because people had to go around, wait, all of that. And Dwayne and I did some uh, tours and press conferences and things, and we were looking at trying to get a third bridge as well in that particular area. I think we got the Chamber of Commerce in, involved, and and the mayors that come out of Ford, and we want to try to see if we can have a third bridge because we don't want to see not necessarily commerce shut down only, but if there's an earthquake or anything of that nature, people can't get in and out in time. One bridge won't do it. You'd be toast, really toast. So if, <clears throat> if you're looking at that, I'd love to talk with you about how we can really find the funding because I think the timing right now is the best it's ever been because we're talking infrastructure from the country. We're talking trillions of dollars, and we probably will never see this kind of... Uh, conversation with that kind of resource coming uh, from our, uh, our federal government, so we, and we need to take advantage of it as quickly as we can. Mr. Chairman, thank you again. Thank you for your presentation. Thank My you. Pleasure. Next name on the list is Representative Keesling. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it. Mr. Brown. It's my understanding you st we were talking about uh, ports. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Washington, the Tri-Cities area in Washington, Pasco, Kenny with Richland. That that is uh, that that's been a rather successful port there, is it not? For that Tri-Cities area, there on the Columbia River, is is that correct, or do you have any knowledge of that? <coughs> I I have a general understanding what goes on in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it, it's kind of a I mean it's all managed by the Corps of Engineers, but their issues are very regional, and, and we're more focused on those with involving the Mississippi and its tributaries. I got you. Okay. Well, that, that which brings me to this. Um, Representative Weaver, myself, uh, Senators Bailey and Yeager, we're, we're very disappointed at this, at this point in time because of uh, access. Uh, what is going on or why isn't something going on between uh, from at least the Carthage area uh, northward on the Cum uh, Cumberland River for uh, barge traffic. Can you give me, and I've got a, I'm going to have two or three, uh, I think, questions here for you. First of all, it's my understanding that it's, it's a dredging issue. Uh, can you bring me in the loop there? Is that true? Can you, con can you confirm that? I don't have direct knowledge of that, sir, and I apologize. I will say that you know between downtown Nashville and out to Gallatin, we run daily, and we take a lot of, we call it dry bulk, bulk fuel, but you could also call it coal if you'd like. We take a lot of coal out to the Gallatin plant, which helps power the, the, the mid-state region here. Our district borders, and our districts border Kentucky, and I know we have a uh, query there, aggregate, that that uh, stated that they would, they, they truly would appreciate or could appreciate something, I think, navigably, and that, if that's the term, commercial. Uh, Salina is as far north as we could go on the on the Cumberland River, but, uh, you know, we need a port there. But but first of all, we need, uh, we need that river to become, uh, you know, usable, if you will, from that standpoint. So I guess, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm directing, uh, although I appreciate Mr. Brown's time, <laughs> And attention, this is something that we need to run by the Corps of Engineers for an explanation as to why we can't get some help there. But anyway, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Yeah, I would just respond to that, sir, that, that you know, the Corps of Engineers is federally required to provide a nine-foot channel. And so if, if, they're, if we're aware that there is less than that when you get beyond Gallatin, that is an issue for them. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Representative Powers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for coming out. Uh, great presentation. Just wanted to mention while you were talking about the tow boat, I looked up the anonyms for tow, and you could call it uh, a drive boat or propel boat since it doesn't tow anything. Those were the opposite, but I just thought that was interesting. But mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, and I don't guess you're going to an electric boat anytime soon where they probably don't have a cord long enough to, to charge that. But, but I was really interested in what you were talking about. Uh, coming up through the Gulf, you, you mentioned the Panama Canal opening up. How do we direct more or how do we attract more traffic uh, through the Gulf and, and up, to, up through Tennessee that way? What, is there anything that we can do or, or what is being done right now in that regard? Yeah, I hate to, to use the tired cliche, if you build it, they will come. But I think this is one of those scenarios. I, I think the sophisticated international shippers, your Walmarts, Home Depots, you know, they're used to the intermodal port um, capacity and opportunities in the coastal areas. And those things just don't exist. Um, even in Memphis, where you have some, some limited intermodal capacity, my understanding is I think a max of 15,000 containers gets handled in the, the Memphis port today. We'd love that to be 1.5 million. And to do that, you need gantry cranes and you need space so you can have interchange yards. But I think if you, if you invest and you show these shippers that Memphis is a serious place to offload containers, that's, that's going to be the next step to attracting some of those shippers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Represent Representative McKenzie, you're recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and th this may not be a, a fair question, the question that, that, that you know, but just from, from my own um, experiences, I know that uh, in, in East Tennessee and Knoxville, I used to see a lot more barge traffic uh, along the Tennessee right there at Neyland Stadium. You know, I guess going from, we got a pretty big industrial park. Is there a reason that that traffic 
has kind of dwindled down to almost nothing now, or, or am I just not looking at the right time? So it just seems to be a, a pretty steep drop off over the last, say, 10, 15 years. I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with the direct numbers. I think our own experience has been that the, the Tennessee River has slowed down commerce wise. Um, I'm sure there are a bunch of factors that play into that, but largely what drives our business is shipper demand. And so if, if the shoreside facilities, um, plants, things like that don't bring their, their commerce to the water, we have nothing to move. All of that said, the Chickamauga lock project is nearing completion. When that's done, we'll now be able to take nine barge tows through that facility, which is a huge improvement over where, where things have been previously. So again, in the, if you build it, they will come spirit, you know, that should have a positive impact on, on what we start moving on or continue moving on the Tennessee River. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Thompson. Okay, Th thank you again for this presentation. It's been very informative. Uh, I agree with my colleague uh, and uh, fellow Memphian uh, representative Towns on the need for uh, um, expanding uh, our capacity in Memphis, especially at the port of Memphis. It's um, um, it's pretty looking pretty shabby now, but it's a lot of space and a lot of room to uh, to grow that. Um, I'm uh, uh, j just a confirmation. My my understanding is that uh, barge traffic is actually has less um, negative environmental impact than any other mode of transportation. Is this true, or can you comment on that? Absolutely. Yes. Going back to the slide that shows the emissions, um, you know, there's a dramatic reduction in emissions in 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 emissions when you move things via the waterways. And so I think uh, international shippers, major companies, they're, they're keenly aware of this, it's something they're paying attention to. And so that's why we feel this is the right time to invest in these, these shoreside facilities that'll help them make this, the shift and, and pull things off of more, more surface, traditionally surface modes. Thank you. Um, yes, you're right. Uh, oh, one more thing. Um, I, I personally, I would really love to uh, take a ride on one of the, at the front <laughs> of the barges, uh, especially if it's on the Mississippi, if that could be arranged. I'm, I'm gonna volunteer my colleague, uh, Representative Towns, to ride with me. We'd be glad to have you, and that's something that we certainly can arrange. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Representative. I would imagine if you'd talk to uh, Ms. Frazier, she'd be glad to help you make that contact, and she's usually around the Cordell Hall building here during session. Um, any other comments, questions from committee? I have, uh, if not, I have a, a couple, or one or two at least. Um, as you know, it's extremely expensive to build roads, interstates, it's in the millions of dollars per mile. Uh, and with that thought in mind, what obstacles does your industry face in expanding your capacity uh, in order to take increased goods to help us with our congestion on our roads? So up until very recently, just in the last year, it was the size of some of these lock and dam structures. But you know, as mentioned earlier, um, with the, the commitment or the confirmation from the Biden administration um, to, to start funding these projects, spe specifically Lock and Dam 25 on the upper Mississippi River, we're now starting to see that, that log jam break free. Um, and this should lead to, I don't want to overstate this, but maybe a renaissance in barge transportation. We'll now have, once these, these projects are complete, larger chambers to go through, which will allow us to move more efficiently and hopefully will you know, drive more commerce to the waterways. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Chickamauga Lock in Chattanooga, and of course that impacts a few of us here. And I remember when that lock was uh, basically declared unusable, and it was a struggle to get funding for it. Finally came through, but it's been ongoing now, the uh, repair and rebuild of that for several years. I was by there two weeks ago and very encouraged to see the progress that's being made. Uh, but I assume that uh, to kind of, kind of give people a perspective, I read about the Chickamauga lock and its impact, and I assume this would be true with most all the locks that you deal with. But that one lock in Chattanooga, had it gone down and could not be used, it would have impacted commerce in seven states. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Is sir. that correct? Yes. So we're talking about tens of thousands of employees, millions and millions of dollars in commerce, so it has a, every, every lock has a tremendous 
economic impact on the economy in the United States, especially in the Midwest region. So I can appreciate your comments about uh, needing upgrades to the infrastructure, and I would certainly support that. Uh, any other comments? Representative Grills. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate it. I, I farm in northwest Tennessee, and the majority of my district is agriculture. And we understand the importance that, that you guys uh, and, and your industry, they give to us. We, we 75 cents to a dollar a bushel more on our grain, on our corn and soybeans, to some of my, compared to some of my friends in Oklahoma or Kansas. And we understand the importance of you guys being uh, in the business for a long time for our sustainability. So uh, with that, I just want to let you know how much I appreciate it. And the folks in our area appreciate you. I'd like to just add that we, we really appreciate grain chippers. You know, a strong harvest usually equates to a very strong year for us in the barge industry. So we appreciate everything that you're growing surface side. Well, we, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with uh, whenever the, uh, the rivers are down, the barge traffic slows down, and we understand you can't load as heavy. And those bases there, they start to, they start to shrink. And that just takes money out of our pockets. So we understand every time the water gets a little lower how important you are, even that much more. So thank you once again. Thank you. Representative Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just had one question about one of the graphics you'd put up, and I've seen part of this graphic before, and it's on the fuel economy uh, and compared to 18-wheelers um, and trains. And I, I know the uh, locomotive uh, or the train industry has advertised for years how far, how many tons or how many miles one ton can be hauled with one gallon of fuel. Is that generally based on an, an average from start to finish of a trip, or is it at the peak most efficient part of that trip? How, how are those metrics uh, measured? Unfortunately, I don't know the methodology at play there. I could find out for you, though, sir. It, when, when we do those studies, it's usually when we partner with um, research institutions. We've done, we've done some work with UTK um, on, on recent studies. Not that one particularly, I don't believe. But I could find out through one of the industry groups what the, what the methodology used was. I would appreciate it. It's not a high priority, but it's just a curiosity, and it makes sense. I mean, it... You can, you can look at it and, and know the volume that's being carried by one of these uh, uh, boats and, and know that it's, it's got to be a much more efficient way than breaking it up into small segments and a bunch of individual engines pushing it along the way. So it makes a lot of sense. Thank you, sir. Well, sure. And just to, to tack on to your question, if you think about moving upriver against the current versus downriver, there's a difference there, obviously. So I, I, would, I would hope to, to, to think that they average the two up and downriver instead of just cherry picking the downriver. Mm -hmm. Very good. Represent Representative Towns. Chairman, thank you again. Chairman, in light of your comments as it relates to what's happened, happened in Chattanooga and what happened, you know, in Shelby County, um, Memphis, Arkansas Bridge, and just, you know, generally around the country probably, I would like to, to encourage all of us to begin to think about, you know, any system that we build because of the massive amount of impact it has on people. You said seven states, okay? That's a lot. That's a, quite a bit. And so if we have only one, we only have a primary way uh, of doing business one way. You know, when I was a kid, you know, they taught us always about, if, the, if there's a fire in the front of the house, you go out the back door, okay? And then they taught us about windows and things of that nature. On our system today, we, it doesn't seem as if we have the necessary backups on our system. That's dangerous for a country this large. That means infrastructure. That means transportation and food. As uh, <clears throat> my colleague uh, that's farming down there is talking about, we need to figure out how to have manual, sometimes a secondary backup system on anything that we do because it's too devastating when stuff goes down. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. You're going to pay for it in loss, opportunity loss, or cost. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. And everything, Mr. Chairman, I know, comes with a price. Even a cemetery plot, you got to have, got to pay for it. But, you know, it's something that we need to think about as the world changes and our population grows and grows and grows. How do we have these secondary systems in place so we can keep our country moving, you know, just, just a comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Any other comments from members? Mr. Brown, thank you so much. Very engaging presentation. I, I learned a lot, and I appreciate you taking the time to address the committee today. Thank, thank you, Mr. You Chairman. So it's my honor. Thank you so much.
Uh, members, we will have our next meeting uh, next Tuesday at 8 a.m. In, in this room, do I hear a motion to adjourn? We are adjourned.